Welcome to the CBF Gathering. My name is Tyler Tankersley, and I serve as the pastor of Ardmore Baptist Church in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Thank you so much for taking the time to be part of this opportunity to pray, to worship, to reflect, and to gather together as God's beloved community. I'm speaking to you from our beautiful sanctuary here at Ardmore Baptist Church. Every week when I come into this room to record my sermon for our worship video, my heart is heavy at not seeing the faces of this beautiful congregation sitting in these pews. But even in the midst of this time, we, we've never stopped being community to one another. It just looks different. In some ways, it looks a little smaller. Over my shoulder, you can see that we have a stained glass depiction of Jesus' parable of the sower. Jesus was constantly using agricultural imagery in his stories, but he always tended to focus on the small. One sower, one seed, one lamb. You know, during this time, churches across the fellowship have adapted their practices to focus in some ways on the small. We have sown seeds of the kingdom. We've recognized the power that's found not just in a sanctuary filled with singing people, but also in socially distanced front yard chats with our neighbors. We have found ways to serve that move us past large-scale operations and instead focus on what we can do to love on the teachers and the staff at the local elementary school in our neighborhood. We have recognized that relationships are to be cherished and valued and justice for all people is to be preserved. And those begin with small acts in our own lives, seeds of the kingdom. We have seen that caring for our congregations in the midst of these days is not just about brilliant sermons or compelling music. It is found in the small acts of reaching out to a lonely senior a stressed-out parent, a frustrated nurse, a caring doctor. So as we gather together in this moment, may we all have hearts and minds that are open to the ways that God may be calling us to sow small seeds for the kingdom of God in our midst. Seeds of gentle love, seeds of prophetic justice, and seeds of authentic community. Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand I start to fall all these lonely roads that I have traveled on, there was Jesus. When the life I built came crashing into the ground, and the friends I had were nowhere to be found, I couldn't see it then, but I can see it. There was Jesus In the waiting, in the searching In the healing and the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken pieces Every minute, every moment Where I've been and where I'm going Even when I didn't know it I couldn't see it Yeah. 
Kristen Pope and I serve at First Baptist Church of Rome as the Minister of Faith Development. As I was thinking about what I might title this devotion, I thought about how often at the end of commercials for alcohol, they put words up on the screen that say, please drink responsibly. I think that I might title this devotion, The Bible, Please Use Responsibly. Our text for this morning is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, and I'll read those a little later. But first, I want to tell you that a few Sundays ago, First Baptist recognized our rising first graders, as we do in August of each year. As a way to mark their growth along their faith journey, we give them age-appropriate Bibles. This year, because of COVID, they weren't able to walk up on Sunday morning to receive them, so I delivered them in the week following. As I handed each of them their Bibles, I felt the need to tell them all of the things this book was for. It is for guidance, for prayer, for encouragement, direction. This Bible is meant to be a close companion with them along their Christian journey. However, I also felt compelled to tell them what this Bible is not for. I wanted to say this Bible is not intended to be a weapon. It is not meant to hurt others or to make them feel lesser. We talk about how the Bible is a tool, but perhaps we should be clear that it is not a hammer meant for smashing. Now, this might seem like a silly thing to say, but it isn't because all around us we see people wielding the Bible as a weapon, using its words to threaten and inspire fear. Some of this is done blatantly. Pay attention to the way Christian political rhetoric will ramp up in the coming months. How many times you see statements made about how Democrats or Republicans can't possibly be good Bible-believing Christians. Just the other day, I saw the statement made on Facebook you can't possibly read the Bible and still vote that way. Whether we realize it or not, we have shaped God in our own political image. And in doing so, we have used the Bible, all of us across the aisle, to prove that God would be on our side were God in the voting booth. Suffice it to say, in the political arena, the Bible is more often used as a flaming arrow to set our political opponent aflame than it is used as a reminder of how to love our political neighbor well. But not all instances of using the Bible to hurt others are that blatant. Now, indeed, on my best days, I believe that most of this is unintentional and inconspicuous. Let me offer an example from my own life and the lives of many other females in our midst. The doctrine of modesty. Many girls are told somewhere along the way in our Christian journey that modesty is a biblical virtue we ought to follow. This tendency that we have to take a word and say that it's biblical is a dangerous practice when we don't fully consider the implications or the context of the word we're extolling as a biblical virtue. When we talk to girls about modesty, we end up talking about dress lengths, 
and spaghetti straps. We imply or say out loud directly that we are responsible for making sure our brothers in Christ don't struggle on account of our shoulders or knees. Amy Peterson wrote an exceptionally good book titled Where Goodness Still Grows, examining what have been called biblical virtues throughout the years. And in her chapter on modesty, she states, the modesty doctrine taught us to be afraid of our own bodies instead of recognizing them as good creations and gifts from God. Not only is this use of the Bible causing grown women to still feel insecure and ashamed of their bodies, not only is it still causing grown men to think they have the right to comment or judge what a woman is wearing, it is also largely not what the Bible was talking about when it extolled modesty as a virtue. Consider the verses most often used to convince women that modesty is indeed biblical and directly related to our bodies. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8-10 through 10. I desire then that in every place that men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling, likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control not with braided hair and gold or pearls and costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. So here's the thing. The modesty Paul is referring to here isn't about skin showing. It's about flaunting markers of our social status and wealth. The pearls, braided hair, and costly attire Paul mentions in this scripture aren't negative because they made women too attractive for men to control themselves, a completely separate and ridiculous thing that we are implying when we talk about modesty. It was because they were indicative of privilege and high social status, and Paul wanted the church to be a place where everyone felt of equal value and worth, where we weren't wasting our time comparing ourselves to one another. So really, as Amy Peterson also says in her chapter on modesty, a more fitting contemporary application of this verse, intended for the ears of both men and women, would be to ask people not to drive their expensive cars to church or wear fancy jewelry or fine clothing. How would that virtue of modesty ring in the ears of most of our middle-class churches? where truth be told, we tend to wear our social privilege without much thought. The motivation for modesty, then, is not for women to wear sweaters over their sleeveless dresses. Rather, it is to be mindful of the ways we wear and show our power and wealth, so that we encourage unity in the church and try to ease the divisions made by class and privilege and other oppressive social systems. My point in all of this is that we ought to be more careful of the ways we use the Bible to justify our own points of view. Whether we are using it to tell our neighbor across the political aisle that they simply can't be Christian, or telling a little girl that modesty is what God requires of her, or even considering as an adult in church whether we ought to tell that woman that her dress is a little too short for the sanctuary. Let's investigate what's truly driving those conversations. Is it the Bible and the virtues it extols? Or is it more often our use of the Bible as a hammer to drive our own nails of opinion in? Plucking words like modesty out of the text and using it to bolster our opinions of the ways women should dress and exist in the world is just one of the many hidden and insidious ways that we use the Bible as a weapon. Now, don't worry. I didn't give that particular spiel to any of our first graders as I handed them their Bibles. But I do intend to remind them often as they grow to be careful about how they use the words in their Bibles. They are precious words meant to lovingly guide and inspire, not to limit or to shame. So, Fellow Christians of all ages, let's be responsible Bible owners, shall we? Pray with me. 
God, we find ourselves in unfamiliar territory. Strangers without knowing exactly what to do, which way to go, or even at times how to maneuver. We have a pandemic, COVID-19. Racism and race relations seems to be breaking down every day. Political opposition on both sides. Our moral consciousness has seemed to grow cold. We ask for your direction, your peace, and your wisdom to navigate in times like the ones we find ourselves in. In times like this, God, we ask and know that even as we seek your guidance, our anxiety, our fear may rise. But let us in these moments cling to your ever unchanging hand. Pour out your spirit on your beloved children as we continue in this work to dismantle systems of oppression, O oh God. Seeing people as you see them, helping the least, the left out, and yes, God, the looked over. Grip us with your pain to help those who are wounded, abused, and victims of violence. Grace us with your agony and burning thirst for justice and righteousness. Give us the courage and strength and compassion, O oh God, to not stand on the sidelines, to not be critical, but to continue to help make this world all the more better, our communities all the more better, and to make your church a better church for all people. God, we give you this prayer. We leave it in your hands now. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, and all God's people said, amen and ashe. Uh, hi, I'm Shaw Ibulus. I'm field personnel. I serve the Lord in Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, as you heard on the news, we had a very big explosion that took place on the port of Beirut. And uh, there is uh, really more than 200 people uh, lost their lives. Around 300,000 people, uh, they left their homes. They cannot come back to their homes. Uh, more than six to 7,000 wounded people. Uh, when that happened, we felt that the need, we uh, want to be involved of what is going on. So we went, uh, started to visit the area over there and uh, go and see how we can extend some help for the hurt people over there. Uh, I felt that uh, we need to to help some of the people uh, to have uh, their home be repaired. Uh, I'm talking about the light damages uh, in some of the houses, so they need like windows, uh, doors. Uh, some of them, they need roofs so they can uh, come back uh, to their uh, home and to live back in their home. Uh, so uh, the construction process takes time. Uh, for the first week, uh, we were able uh, to help uh, uh, three different sources. We helped two people to reinstall their roofs, and uh, we helped another house to install uh, glass so they can uh, come back. And another lady, she had a uh, completely broken door, uh, so we had uh, to replace that for her, and now she's back home. Uh, my, our plan is uh, to be able to help three to four uh, different uh, hurt uh, homes and people over there. And our target is, uh, and God willing, uh, to show them that there are some uh, people from the other side of the world, uh, good churches, uh, good people who uh, believes in them uh, here, so we praise God for your prayer, for your support, uh, for everything you're doing. Uh, and uh, we count on you folks. Thank you. Hello, friends. This is Mahabulos from uh, Beirut, Lebanon. I'm here to update you about the port blast that happened on August 4th. Um, we have started helping people ever uh, since it, this happened. Uh, uh, the first week we were able to pass some uh, food packages and give some medicine to families who were, uh, whose houses and lives were shattered by the blast. We went into uh, the streets that were mostly damaged by the blast. 
uh, we've been uh, going to Gymnasium, St. Michael, Carantina, uh, all these uh, places we have visited. Uh, there are many roads and streets that we can visit. And we went and visited people and we gave out the food packages. We also uh, talked to them and we also uh, uh, prepared some medicine for them. Uh, I want to thank you all for helping us uh, and standing by our side and uh, for, be, for helping us be the hands and feet of the Lord Jesus in this disaster. Hello, I'm Lawrence Powers, pastor here at Benson Baptist Church in Benson, North Carolina. And I've been asked to bring a few moments of challenge and encouragement for our gathering together this night. Specifically, I was asked to think about what does it mean for us to have bold faith in our lives and in the world in which we live? And as I reflected on this idea of bold faith, I couldn't help but find my mind being drawn back to just eight months ago on January 1st, 2020, when I became pastor here at Benson Baptist, my first pastorate. And as I stepped into this congregation, as I stepped into the lives of this and in this community for the first time, one of the verses that came to mind for me was Ephesians 3, chapter, verses 20 through 21, where Paul says to the church at Ephesus, Now to God who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to God's power that is at work within us, to God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now, on January 1st, when I reflected on these words from Ephesians 3, to have bold faith in that moment was easy. We were trusting that the God that we were following is going to do immeasurably more than anything we had asked for or imagined, because God had done that so many times in this congregation since 1887 when it was founded. But quickly, in March, COVID-19 hit. And all of a sudden, our deacons were having to make decisions about going online, completely not gathering in this sanctuary, which congregations at Benson Baptist have been doing since the 1920s. At that moment, everything was turned upside down. And trusting the God who is a God of immeasurably more with bold faith became more difficult. We saw it again in April as the nation began to address something that many thought was history, but that most of us knew was not and begin to divide across all kinds of lines and how we should respond to racial tension and racial injustice and implicit and explicit bias, not only in our nation and in our community, but even in our churches. Where is the God of immeasurably more in that, we said. How do we have bold faith moving forward? Everything is being turned upside down. Well, as I've reflected on this in my own pilgrimage of faith over these last few months, I've realized something. And that is that we often get caught up in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21, on the first part of verse 20. Now to God, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine. We stop there. And when what we've asked for or imagined isn't happening, because our world has been turned upside down, we begin to doubt. We begin to lose boldness in our faith. But friends, the verse does not stop there. Because the next part of that verse says, according to God's power that is at work within us. And over these last eight months, as I've transitioned into Benson, and over the last months that have followed that, around all of the things that have turned our world upside down, as I've asked the question, how do we have bold faith in a God who does immeasurably more? We come together. We find ways to be a unified body, not always uniform, but to have hope and to have promise in tomorrow, to trust that as we move forward, as we serve in new ways, as we figure out what does it mean to be Christians, what does it mean to be the church of Christ even in these new topsy-turvy, upside-down places in which we live, we realize that to have bold faith is to trust that our God is still a God of immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine because... Our God partners with us. And so as we move from this place this night, I pray that you and that I will be challenged to know that God is still doing immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. But in that, God is calling us to work. God is calling us to not lose faith. God is calling us to have hope when everyone else has given up. 
And God is calling us to remember that a measure of it more than we could ever ask or imagine is still in front of us. And God is calling us to have bold faith, to partner with God as we move forward. So friends, now to God who is able to do a measure of it more than we could ever ask or imagine, through God's power that is at work within us, may we hear that challenge and may we have bold faith to step forward in the future with hope and to know that the best is still ahead of us if we just work, if we just toil, and if we just keep moving down that hard road.